you say that Muslim unity as a collective obligation is inessential, we can get to Jannah without it, then we can get to Jannah without any collective obligation. Just pray and fast and tick the basic boxes. But look at the type of collective obligation we have. Learning and ta'aleem beyond the basics. Communal aspects of ibadat, mu'amalat, institutions. Defense and security, zakat as an institution, law, judiciary, enjoining good. If we say all of this is inessential to Islam, what do you, what do you got left? We have the final speaker in this session, uh, Sheikh Uthman Badr, and uh, he's going to address doubts and contentions uh, regarding the priority of Muslim unity. So I will give you the floor, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala We were having lunch uh, yesterday just here in the uh, Istak Cafe at some a very nice Malaysian mandi and shawarma the ubiquitous shawarma all over Kuala Lumpur and uh, one of the many warm and loving brothers Abdullah Ali in fact explained to us that he's keeping us with some of the Malay and he explained that in Malay, when you want to say thank you, you say terima kasih, or something like that. Uh, but he was explaining that what, literally what it means is accept my love and accept affection. Accept my love. That's the way of saying thank you. And I found that very, very beautiful. Uh, and so I want to start by saying terima kasih to all the local hosts and the institutions um, as I begin to talk about a topic that requires love and affection amongst the believers, Muslim unity. And I want to start with a question, because I think behind this question is a narrative, and in fact a, a struggle of narrative, a narrative battle. That battle might be a strong word because this is a discussion amongst believers. It's a discussion, it's a genuine, honest discussion, a debate uh, amongst Believers, amongst family, amongst friends. Nevertheless, there are multiple narratives. What is the ultimate goal of Islam? Some people, some scholars, individuals, activists, suggest that, end of the day, ultimately, Islam is a deen that is an individual spiritual journey. Ultimately, it's about achieving the pleasure of Allah and individual salvation in the akhirah. And therefore, something like Muslim unity, and here's the connection, although desirable, good if we could have it, good to work for if feasible, is not essential to Islam. It's an argument. Because, can you get to Jannah Whilst living in a non-Islamic polity? Yes. Are you guaranteed Jannah even if you are living in an Islamic society? No. Therefore, it's not essential to the deen. This is an argument. Now, I just, I'll paint that picture because I think this is, at the, this is in the background of some of the points that we need to get straight. This is a narrative that I think is alluring it's simplistic, it has an allure, but ultimately I want to argue it is incorrect. When we talk about Muslim unity, I want to start with two points. First of all, I want to reiterate one of the points that Dr. Anjum made, and I should say, coming uh, behind Dr. Anjum and Dr. Hanif makes my job both harder and easier. Harder because I can't follow up the eloquence and the erudition, but easier because they've already made a number of the points that I wanted to make. And so I will be able to go over them a lot quicker. I want to reiterate one of the points made by saying that unity, when we talk about unity, it's not about uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is solidarity with diversity. Let me repeat that. Unity is not uniformity. It is solidarity with diversity. That's the first point. The second point is when we, when we talk about unity, we throw around the word unity, united, brotherhood, solidarity. We're actually, sometimes we're actually talking about different things. But these things go together. And so I have this uh, nice triangle uh, on the slide. I think we can talk at least about three types of unity that are analytically separate, 
but in the actual, in, in the real world, they exist together. And that's the aspiration. That's what we should be aspiring to, that these, this is a, the prism of ummatic unity requires all three. First of all, theological. Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa." The believers, only the believers, the believers, those who have iman, are brothers. So the ground is iman. The brotherhood, the union, the unity is grounded in iman. Ibn Ajiba, rahimahullah, the famous 18th century Moroccan mufassir, he comments on this verse saying that, uh, They are all affiliated to one origin, wa huwa al-iman. Al-mujibu lil hayat al abadiyya the, the, the fundamental basis is Iman, which necessitates or the fruit of which is eternal life in the Akhirah. So effort is required. Note this point. The Iman, the La ilaha illallah, creates the union, the brotherhood, but effort is required in maintaining actual strong ties to realize true brotherhood. That's theological. And so the theological almost naturally, logically leads to the social, social unity. So theological is anyone that says la ilaha illallah is a brother or a sister. You're in a union. That leads to social or solidaristic unity, which should probably be solidaritistic, but that's a mouthful. So I've thrown out a couple of letters. Um, Social, like solidarity, and I like that word. I want to come back to that. Uh, Allah says, Al Mu'minuna wal Mu'minat, Ba'aduhum awliya'u ba'ad. The believers, men and women, are protectors, allies, awliya, one to another. Uh, Imam al Qurtabi on this verse says, Because their hearts are united. Belief, one belief, but now the hearts are united. Muttahida fit tawadi wa tahabi wa ta'atuf. In affection, in love, here comes the love, the affection. And of course, there are many ahadith. I just mentioned one, Prophet ﷺ said, as narrated in Sahih Bukhari, Al Mu'minu, Lil Mu'mini, Kalbunyan. The believer to another believer is like a building. Yashuddu ba'duha ba'dan. Yashuddu ba'duhu ba'dan. They strengthen each other, they consolidate each other, they enforce or reinforce each other. And I really like this word, I think there's. It's not about liking, this is the kalam of the Prophet. The word shadda, ya shuddu, shaddan, has, I think, uh, good resonances with the word I used earlier, solidarity. Because solidarity is union, fellowship, based on common responsibilities and interests. And it comes from the French word solidarité. So from solidary, from solid. The idea is that union creates strength and solidity. A believer is like, believers are like building. You strengthen each other. And so that's why I think this word is, uh, although French, uh, has good uh, resonances and can be used in appropriate or matic ways. So, so that's, the, that's the social... But straight away, you see, already we've now spoken about common interests and responsibilities. And we talk about common interests, common struggles, common purposes. We are now entering the domain of the political. So notice that the triangle is almost working itself out from one to another to another. Before I do that, however, I have to requisite popular... Where is... It's not working. Here we go. Um, can I double-click on the picture? So obviously the word fellowship brings to mind, of course, the most famous fellowship in at least Western cultural recent history, the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, but, but why am I using this? They have a common purpose. Most of them don't get along with each other. There is deep diversity in the Fellowship of the Ring. The elves don't get along with the dwarves. They both think the hobbits, what, is, what's even, what are they doing on the quest? And the wizards are in their own world. So there's, there's diversity, but what are they? They have a common purpose, and for that purpose, they come together. And obviously, the rest is history and fiction as well, but I think it's a good metaphor. 
It has a good uh, symbolism. But I want to get back to the idea of the fact that the social leads naturally into the political and the civilizational. Because when we talk about common purposes, we're, we're talking about communities, different communities, struggles, interests, and as uh, Ustad Sami Hamdi will tell us uh, after lunch, politics is the science of human relations and communities, relation of communities and struggles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this point about civilizational political unity, Allah ta'ala, many, again, many, many verses, the one that comes to mind, uh, I should have it up here, Allah ta'ala says, شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحَ He, Allah, has ordained for you, ordained for you, that, uh, O oh believers, Muslims, that which he enjoined upon Nuh alayhi salam, the first of the messengers. وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ O Muhammad, and that which we have revealed to you. Notice as an aside, the iltifat, from the third to the first person. Addressing the Prophet, Allah turns to the first person. And the alladhi versus the ma, for students of Arabic rhetoric. But the point being made is what? That the religion ordained for Nuh and for the Prophet Sallallahu and for Ibrahim and for Isa and for Musa an aqimu ad-dina wa la tatafarraqu fi that you establish, you uphold the revelation, the deen but the part I want to focus on wa la tatafarraqu fi notice the connection between the civilizational project which uh, Sheikh Hanif, Sheikh Tuhail has spoken about so eloquently and unity don't be divided and why am I reading this as political? What's the very next part of the ayah? كَبُرَ عَلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ What you are calling your da'wah, what you're calling the disbelievers to, bears heavily on them. Because it's very different to their ways. It's a different culture, it's a different fundamentals. Not that they can't adopt it, they can. It's fit for them, it's for all humans. But it requires major changes from them. And when you're talking about this, a community, another community, struggles, interests, cause, we know what happened in the seerah. We're in the realm of the political and the civilizational. So the, the point is unity and strength. Ibn Ashur has a very good comment on this. It's a long one. I'm going to leave it, but uh, as homework, check out the tafsir of uh, Ibn Ashur on this ayah, which is in Surat Shura. Now, the, what's my key point? Those, that triangle... The three sides, it's, a, it's one prism. The three sides, are, they work together. If you undercut one, you undercut the others. But when we, now, that's one point. If the, but the thing is, when we talk about theological unity or social unity, generally in the ummah, these are uncontroversial. Believers are brothers, we should help each other, we should love each other, we should have solidarity. Everyone nods their head. When you talk about the third aspect, you get some raised eyebrows. Some. Not a lot. There are questions, valid questions, good questions, questions we should entertain. And there are contentions, there are doubts. Can we do it? Is it too much? Is it essential? Do we have to do it? Which is where we started. That's why I wanted to focus in the remaining time, the remaining 10 minutes or so, on some contentions specific to civilizational political unity of the Ummah. And I start by mapping the contentions and suggesting that the various contentions within the Ummah on this topic can be categorized into three types. One, those that negate the requirement or the importance or the priority in toto. We don't need it. The others which affirm the importance and desirability, but they say this is not that important. Something we can come to. We've got other things to focus on. And the third is one that just says it may, be, may or may not be important, or actually, no, it is important, but we can't do it. It's too hard. So there's, let's just look at this on a spectrum, two extremes and something in the middle. And I put, it in, I put number two in the middle on purpose because I think it's the most important one. It comes from reputable voices, sincere, reputable, knowledgeable voices of scholars, activists, academics, individuals. 
and therefore it deserves a greater intention. The negation one's fairly easy. This is the idea that comes from, um, I can mention specific names on each of these, but I'm avoiding that today. I want to focus on the ideas, focus on the concepts. The basic contention on the first type is that the early unity, the early civilizational project and unity that we see, Khulafa Rashidin, Abbasids, Umayyads, at least up to the Mongol invasion, some scholars, a fringe, very few, will argue that this was a historical contingency. It doesn't have religious value. It happened at the time. That's how it happened, but it's not significant. I'm not going to address this. I don't think it deserves too much of our time, but um, it has been addressed in various capacities, including on some of the articles on the Omatics website. Likewise, on the other side, impossibility. Why is that impossible? Well, the prevailing world order is really strong. The nation state model is here to stay. We can't push the boundaries. We can't think. We can't imagine other because it's too hard. Or Muslims were never united historically. So your dream to unite is a, is a pipe dream. They were never united. There was always exceptions, maybe for 30 years, 40 years, 100 years out of 1,400, not a lot. Right? And of course, the idea that the Ummah is riddled with intractable division, too much division, too many groups, ethnic, madhab, sectarian, you know, um, phone, phone companies, Apple versus Samsung, and all sorts of uh, other divisions. This is the one I want to focus on, however. I don't want to talk about those two for lack of time. This is, these are the arguments that say unity is important, it's a fard, it's an obligation, Allah requires it of us, but, there's always a but, it's not essential. It's a collective obligation, not an individual one, and individual obligations have priority. It's not feasible, we don't have the solutions, We've got a lot of work to do ahead of us. Muslims are so far away from the basics of Islam. And here you are, you Umatics people, talking about these big dreams. Let's get, the, let's get our people praying and fasting and get the aqidah correct. Let's focus on tazkiyah. Get your priorities right. And of course, there's also a, a, a conservative, quietest voice that just says, Let's not talk of change, it's going to it's fitna. Right? Again, I'm going to have to leave that one out. I want to focus on the first two. Right? Uh, in terms of how we might think about or respond to these contentions. And I just want, this is the slide that I'm going to stop on for this point. Um, because I'm going all the way back to where I started with the two narratives. And I've depicted them here in one circle on this side and three on the other. Basically, if you argue, or the, 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 the narratives that argue against the essentiality of Muslim unity, implicitly or explicitly read Islam as an individual spiritual journey, an individual quest. Whereas what I want to argue is that that's an incorrect reading or at least it's a weak reading. Islam is a communal deen that is at once spiritual and political, that is at once personal and communal. And this is where I don't have to say a lot because as Dr. Omar Suleiman said, Islam privileges the collective over the individual. And he gave many examples. Without, I would add, without uh, getting rid of the individual. It's not socialist, it's not Marxist. The individual dissolves into the community. Thank you. But it is personal and communal at once. You have your personal responsibilities, your individual obligations, and your collective obligations that you contribute to. And it is spiritual and political at once. Again, I don't have to say a lot. Dr. Suhail Hanif, uh, I think the most powerful way of expressing it would be what he said, that Medina, Al-Medina, is the place where deen happens as an organized, structured way of being in the world with a leadership, right? So if we use that metaphor of Medina and, for example, compare it to Makkah as a metaphor, 
or Abyssinia, Habasha as a metaphor, the black circle is saying that Mecca is sufficient for individual salvation. Abyssinia is sufficient for individual salvation. But I think I want to suggest and argue that it's not. And it's not the result that matters. It's the effort and the, the serious intention and resolve and effort to work towards Medina. As opposed to saying, we're in Abyssinia, life is tough, just let us pray and fast. Someone else can worry about Medina. It'd be nice to have Medina, but X, Y, Z. That's not sufficient. That is undercutting our own capacities, our own abilities, our own exceptionality. Okay? Insert all the points made uh, since the morning. So I don't need to say too, too much more about that. The other point that's coming through in that narrative is the individual collect, individual collect, that somehow individual obligations have priority in an absolute sense where we can deem the collective obligations non-essential. I don't want to, I think it's fair to say individual obligations have some priority. That's where you start. You have to start there. You can't not be praying or fasting or doing your own thing, but you're involved in, or you're, you're prioritizing big projects. That wouldn't be right. But it's not a, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not either or. And there's a problem. If you say that Muslim unity as a collective obligation is inessential, we can get to Jannah without it, then you have to say we can get to Jannah without any collective obligation. Just pray and fast and tick the basic boxes. But look at, look at the type of collective obligation we have in Islam. Learning and ta'aleem beyond the basics. Communal aspects of ibadat, mu'amalat, institutions, defense and security, zakat as an institution. Not the fact that you have to pay, but the institution of zakat, law, judiciary, enjoining good. If we say all of this is inessential to Islam, what do you, what do you got left? That's not, I, I want to argue that's not Islam. That's not the Islam I know. That's not the Islam of the Sirah of the Prophet wasallam. That's a modern, arguably a modernist rendering or reading of Islam that has a very strong Protestant accent. That's Protestant religion. Very personal, very it's about me, very even though I don't want to suggest that the, the, the sincere Muslim scholars and people who carry this view are intentionally going there. It's more implicit, it's more in the assumptions, but I think it's definitely there. One last point on collective obligations. I think there's also in the classical formulation. I would argue it's a case of that every Muslim needs to fulfill their individual obligations and contribute necessarily to collective obligations. Not everyone has to do everything, but you have to do this, and it's essential. It's not, you can't separate one from the other. Whereas this reading takes us somewhere else, where I think there's a misreading of Fard Kifaya. Fard Kifaya, as we know, students of usul, students of fiqh, is that obligation in which Allah seeks the result from the collective as opposed to the fardain where Allah seeks every individual to do the act it's not about essential or inessential they're both essential it's just that in one the result is sought as a requirement the problem if you make it inessential we don't have to, you don't have to do it you've now undercut not just the collective aspect but the obligation aspect last point on the uh, the, the other arm of this narrative that it's not feasible, Muslim unity is not feasible. Now I want to say here, there are valid points. We don't have currently all the thinking, the theorization, the systems, the models, the how that we require. We don't have it. But if I don't have it, should I say, can't do it? Or should I say, let's work to arrive at these solutions. Let's come together. Let's bring our talents and our minds together. Uh, are, are many Muslims away from Islam? Is the Ummah away from Islam in many respects? Yeah. Should I throw my hands up in the air and say it's a bad situation, can't do anything? Or should I say, let's work on that? You get the point. It's a, eminently, it's a glass half full and we can push forward with confidence and resolve and trust in Allah Ta'ala uh, in whom rests all power 
and strength. I will stop there. My time's up. I've got the red card. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.